Uh, I want to say a personal welcome, not having been here for a few months, to everybody. And I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Katie Zimmerman. Uh, I had the pleasure of joining her for, for dinner earlier, and uh, I don't know how much we're going to hear about her somewhat serendipitous uh, 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 path to, uh, to Dubai, uh, but that's not going to be the main subject of her talk this evening. She uh, uh, and your presence here tonight will have disproved that old adage about wild horses couldn't drag me out of the house tonight uh, because all of you have in fact left the house for, uh, for wild horses. Uh, Katie, you will have noticed as a, as a senior biologist with uh, Dubai Holdings Green Planet where she manages uh, flora and uh, fauna uh, collections. Uh, she's done uh, she worked uh, overseas in South America and in uh, in Asia and in, in Mongolia, uh, and I'll I think I'll for all the rest I I'm never sure uh, what uh, intersect things like intersectionality means so I'm going to I'm going to leave that to uh, to Katie to explain. Welcome to Katie Zimmerman. Oh. Thank you all so much for coming tonight, for joining me as I share a bit about Mongolia. And more importantly, well, more specifically, the forces in Mongolia, the Taki. And I call a few other things tonight, we'll go through, they've got a nice long list of names, uh, but mostly we'll probably refer to them as the Taki. So thank you for that intro. Okay, well, it was good walk, Austin. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, there it's just because we'll stand up below. So you click it for it. Thanks. All right, a little bit about me. I'm not very technology, um, but I am great with animals. And I get to spend my time caring for the animals and for the people that care for the animals at the Green Planet. I grew up on a farm. That's my sister's horse. Um, I just spend a lot of time with animals and it's been great. Um, I also am a conservation biologist and have spent a lot of time uh, in the field studying conservation biology, got my master's in conservation biology. And through that is what allowed me to have this very interesting experience with the Mongolian wild horse, the Taki. So these are Taki. This is my first experience with the Taki wild, but in captivity. This is at the DC Zoo. So the Taki are at this zoo. I had two named Minnesota and Rose. They're my first experience with these horses that are not like domestic horses. In a way, like the work is similar in caring for these horses, but they're very much uh, a wild species. And so I take a moment to appreciate this picture because this is one with their summer coat on the right here and their winter coat on the left. You can tell there's quite a big difference here. Um, they get very shaggy. They also get a bit of a beard in the winter as well, um, and get quite lucky. So what are the Taki? They have quite a few different names to them. Um, this weird word at the top, I know it's spelled like Krizalski. Some people call it that. Shabalski is how it is said. Um, so Shabalski's horse, they are named after a Russian explorer who first described them to the West. Um, they're also called the Mongolian wild horse, not confused with Mongolian horse, which is a different species. And then the Asiatic wild horse, and one that I've heard her time you know, saying, the Jungarian horse. I'm sure I said that wrong, but it's not very commonly used. Um, so a bit about them, like many horse species, they live in harems, so usually one dominant male, as well as multiple mares, 
and their offspring, usually around five to 15 in a group or so. So they are native to Central Asian steppe, kind of. I say kind of because these species, this species is ancient. They are living fossils uh, of the four major terrestrial animals known in the Ice Age. We've got the mammoth, we've got the woolly rhino, the bison, and these guys, the tataki as well. So this species is really old. As a result, they actually used to be found pretty much prolific throughout the northern hemisphere. They were from North America all throughout Europe and Asia, but from what we kind of know in like modern day human history, the same thing that took out the mammoths, also took out these guys as well, the grand megafauna extinction of North America. Well, they pretty much left during that time too. So from more of a modern history, then we're looking more at Europe and in drought nation's death. They are a smaller species coming in at about 300 kilos, um, but size-wise, they're like a large pony kind of size. They are stocky and they are hardy, especially being able to endure um, these pretty harsh Asiatic winters. Survive in these Eastern Europe winters on the grasses and limited supply of it, they can go pretty well on pretty low nutrients for quite a long time, so many months. Um, and they're considered to be the only truly wild species of horse left. So many of you might be thinking of like wild horses elsewhere in the world. Um, in America, we've got the Mustangs, there's wild horses in Australia as well, in Asia, but these horses are all descended from a domestic, well, another species of horse, the tarpon. Tarpon, extinct, went extinct in the 19th century. That horse species is gone, but all of our domestic horses are their descendants. What we've got left of the wild species, it's um, so, of the many equids, I just also want to point out this is what we would consider of like to be like similar to the horses we know. I also do want to acknowledge the zebra are also in the equid family, as well as the Asiatic donkey, the African donkey. Um, but as far as what we would more consider of like a horse, it's these. So, in Mongolia, these guys have. Pretty high cultural relevance. It is on the currency in Mongolia. It is known throughout their culture and their heritage. These horses are very prominent. They do have their own domestic species, the Mongolian horse. Let's not be confused. But here's a picture down here. Um, so if we know back to side, Jessica can kind of describe the Mongolian horse. Key differences, these guys have white nuzzles, they have, or muzzles. They've got these like black legs. It sounds like they're wearing these dark stockings. They've got a dorsal stripe. So a dark stripe down the back. They've got a bit of stripiness on the legs as well. Um, and so while they kind of uh, are stout, these guys look like a child's drawing made of rectangles. Like if you could only use rectangles and squares to build a horse, <laughs> This is what you got here. Um, so they are very blockish. Um, and this is also one of the reasons that horse culture became very big in Mongolia. So this is Genghis Khan here, an artistic drawing of Genghis here on his horse. Um, and so Mongolians are a prominent horse riders. It's part of their culture, it's part of their heritage. Um, and especially because horses have allowed them to conquer so much. <laughs> this is kind of their claim to fame and definitely still, still very prominent to the point they even have serial, serial, ceremonial <laughs> banners are still made out of horse hair and it is just a big part of the tradition. So going to the history of the Taki. So this species went down. Population-wise, it went as far down as it gets. They went extinct in the wild. Um, but how did it get there? So they were throughout Europe. The last known one was uh, killed in Germany in 1814. 
but then there were still some in Asia, kind of smaller populations, pretty fragmented. Um, and so then there was these capture campaigns, these attempts to get these, these few remaining species, or these few individuals into human care. Let's catch them, let's catch what's left and, and bring it in. I, I like the notion of it. There's not many left, we wanna save it. But it was a disaster. <laughs> so many were caught. Um, and so of the few that were left, we, we got 11. Of all that were caught, 11 survived. Um, they are a very much wild species. Uh, they are not easy to catch. They, they are feral, large animals that um, people try to take in with good intentions, but it, it didn't go well. So unfortunately, only 11 made it through that, that pretty hard process. Um, and that was only of the, the juveniles that were able to survive. Of the 52 juveniles, the foals, the little ones, um, the 11 made it. And so then we have these 11, the population is built up in human care. They're then prominent throughout zoos in Europe. They are breeding. It took a lot. There was a lot of setbacks, but finally have a good population of them. And then who wants to guess why in 1945, the only ones we have left are in unit in Paraguay? Yes. Um, there were so many of these horses left in zoos in Europe after the World Wars. Uh, so as a result, then we're back down to a pretty low population um, of, of these horses in captivity. There are still a few in the wild, but not for very long, because then the last one known in the wild, a stallion, which was near the Gobi Desert, uh, that was the last time it was seen in Mongolia um, and, and in the wild in general. So this population was gone from the wild state. So the only ones we have left are derived from that original 11 that were caught. But there is hope this story, because 30 years later, they did wind up back on the wild again. So because these species were able to then be bred in human care, through a bit of trial and error, they were able to have this population increase uh, to the point where they are started setting up reserves, started setting up areas to try to rewild this species. Uh, to get them more custom to, to the one on what that would look like. And it's kind of a slow process, especially because we're coming out of uh, zoos, but we're talking zoos from many decades ago. They're not like modern facilities. These animals were not kept like, maybe if you've been to some of the other ones, they, they were just kind of kept behind bars for human entertainment and not as much for conservation. That wasn't a priority. So this species, it wasn't really used to just roaming wild in these fields. They're still wild, but they didn't like have that capacity to act like a wild horse. I'm sorry, I also want to apologize. I know these slides have quite a lot of text on it. Um, <laughs> we'll get to more pictures later. So then these enclosed reserves were set up in Canada, throughout Europe, throughout parts of Asia as well, to try to introduce the species to maybe one day being in the wild again. Uh, so then in 1990, we get to having a larger population. Um, so there's nearly a thousand uh, of this. So it's just amazing. And then by 992, we start to release them. Uh, and so uh, Husay National Park, this is in Mongolia. Um, and so they were held in these spaces to get adapted to what life would be like. They may have been in these other areas, but this way, they're actually where they're going to be released. So like, these are the grasses you will learn to eat. This is the weather you will learn to endure. This will be your home range. Uh, and this is kind of where they had to start introducing them to the wild. This also is done in other places now too. It's it's become a very common practice trying to rewild species, especially if we see 
so much of our, our larger fauna become endangered uh, and, and losing uh, so much habitat, trying to redevelop their habitat and then it release them back into the wild. So that is pretty common to do now, but this is kind of the really the first original success story of trying to rewild an animal from extinction. It's one that many zoos point back to as this is a reason to have this. Somehow keeping and preserving these genetics in human care, it does work because look at this success story. So it took, again, trial and error. Um, it did take a lot, of course, it's gonna be poured into the system to figure out like, how do we wild them well? Where they're not still reliant on coming back for the food that's provided to them. And so these are times where we're then able to start pushing these horses out where they don't need to be provided with the provisions. I'll get to it, why Husai was the place that was chosen. So populations increase, and then it goes down again. These are areas with really harsh winters. They have hard events, um, especially as we see things like the climate changing, we get perturbations, which is like an ecologist's term to mean those shocks to the system, those one-off events, uh, droughts, sudden floods, um, or a late in season snowfall, these are the things we don't expect. Usually a species can reach equilibrium afterwards, but if genetic diversity is so low, it is very hard for a species to bounce back, or if the population is so small, it's very hard for the population to bounce back after these crazy events. So in 2009, just a series of normal events that occur, but multiple of them hitting at once, crushed the population again, and we lost two thirds of that wild species in Mongolia. But there's still hope and they're still trying and there's still more of these horses being released in the wild and they are reproducing. We've had over 300 successful births in wild populations of this horse. So the population is increasing which is incredible and Prog Zoo is planning to now release them in new areas where they don't have a population already. So they plan to uh, release some in a reserve deposit and this is set up for them and that's been identified as a good place for this horse species to reside. So we went from having a, a range throughout the whole northern hemisphere or at least throughout Europe and most of Asia to now having the small pink spots that you see on the screen. Yeah, and that's just within a couple hundred years. These are the spaces that uh, the horses have been released back into. Um, and then I just wanna mention this guy right here. Um, this is the area that my research really focuses on, and these horses right here. Oh, and that's it's pretty close to the capital. Ulan Batar, that's the capital. I've decided very convenient. So of the 11, nine were able to successfully reproduce. And there was some hybridization in there too, because they can breed with the domestic horses and produce fertile offspring. So they were housed with a uh, domestic horse. And as a result, all of the horses, or at least the vast majority of them, had now have some kind of domestic lineage to them. Um, I do want to point out that they are so wild though, even if they have domestic hybridization. And we know that through chromosomes. So, a domestic horse should only have 64 chromosomes. However, the Taki has 66. It does identify them as a separate species, even though they can produce fertile offspring. There's kind of this weird thing, in especially uh, biology, and where what do I identify as a species? Like what makes a species a species versus a subspecies? How is it different? 
Um, so oftentimes people point, is it able to pro produce fertile offspring? That's what makes the species. Um, but another way of going off of it is, is through chromosomes, like DNA, how, how different is it? So because of how different that is, we're able to identify this. This is a separate species, even if they can interbreed it, and have fertile offspring, it does not make them now domestic horses. Uh, so now of the nine individuals, we're now looking at over 1,300 wild turkey approximate. These numbers are very approximate. They are very elusive. They're hard to study. Um, although we do have tracking collars on so many, we've got silent imagery. There's a lot of technology and advancements in that that allow for the tracking of these animals. They still don't want to be around people. They they have gotten very used to being very solitary and they they're pretty shy and skittish as well. Uh, they are prey species. So as a result, they are very hard to study and hard to find. And there are now six reserves, reserves, national parks. Some of these are still like enclosed spaces, even if they're huge. Uh, so they are considered wild, even if technically there might be a fence somewhere. But they're not over the woods yet. There is still a lot happening to these species, uh, to the first species, to the tacky. Um, so here's just a nice list of things that they are facing right now. Like so many animals all over the world as we face the next great extinction. Uh, we are losing this species to, to mining, both legal and illegal and military operations as well that kind of have their own habitat issues. Uh, to hybridization with domestic horses, uh, desertification. So as the climate changes, as these uh, sheep and goats rip up the grasses, it turns to desert area, predation. There are wolves, disease, and low genetic variability. That's a huge one. It's believed disease wiped out the first time. What's it going to take to wipe them out again? They do have um, still, a, well, a significant enough genetic diversity where stochastic models do say that they should be able to make it with a pretty high confidence level. Okay, that's just some nice ecology language to me. We think that they should be fine with their genetics, even though they've had a bottleneck at some point, not too long ago. Um, and then we get overgrazing of livestock, and that is a huge one. So these horses are now in competition with so many other species for the same space. It was hard for them in these spaces beforehand, before we've got herders now bringing in their livestock. And now they're competing with these other animals, and these other animals are bringing in diseases, and they're having new encounters with species they wouldn't otherwise encounter, especially when it comes to resources like water. If that kind of like chart folks that are able to dig for water away, it's kind of weird, but water is a scarcity in places like this for parts of the year. And so when you're competing with cattle, with uh, the goats, with sheep, with other horses, um, and because these horses are pretty recluse, they, they don't want to be around human populations, they tend to get pushed out to the farther spaces. That's one of the reasons they believe that the last horse was found near the Gobi Desert. That's not a good place for a horse. There's not a lot happening out there that would be ideal for a horse in the desert. But because of human encouragement, it's believed that was one of the major causes to drive these horses out. And the reason only a few populations were left in these pretty remote areas was because humans had pushed them over to the brink of some pretty uh, remote places, but places that were pretty hard for them to survive in. So this brings us to my time in Mongolia and what I was doing there. So I spent um, a year 
doing research in the States um, and taking data that was already there, communicating with my infield researcher. A lot of the data was already was already made. It's just me coming in and evaluating it. Um, and then kind of going over the literature that was already produced and deciding, was this done well? Were the methods done well? So back when I used that like stochastic variables and the high percentage likelihood of them surviving, it didn't take climate change into consideration. It didn't really take all this other livestock into consideration. All it took into consideration was their genetics. So they should be fine. Are they actually, is they actually have a high chance of surviving? I think you could think maybe otherwise. So my plan was to spend about three and a half weeks collecting qualitative data in and around East Dye National Park to better understand trends in livestock, land use, and climate. So I had the quantitative data, I had the numbers, I had the reports, I had all of the sample links and DNA and publishings and everything. But I was going out with the researcher I had been with. Um, his son was being my translator. And I wanted to collect qualitative data as well. I didn't truly need it, but I wanted it because I think it's important to also hear from those that are around these spaces, to hear from the nomadic people that are also living in these areas and their experiences with this forest, with their livestock, and find out how do we better promote this species. They care about these forces too, but they also care about their livelihoods. <laughs> and then going forward, what would community-based conservation look like for them? So that was my goal. Um, but who here has ever done field research? And has it ever gone according to your plan exactly? Oh, sure. It goes according to plan. <laughs> it would be great if it did, but field research rarely ever happens that way. So I was going to Masai National Park. Um, well, and the reason that they were first introduced here, uh, because it was a large enough space to maintain multiple social groups. Again, they live in harems. But they like well, they're pretty gregarious. They don't really, they don't just become these huge mass herds. They need their own spaces. Um, so it's large enough to support multiple herds of these species without humans providing for them and giving them uh, the supplemental food provisions they would need. Occasionally interjecting with veterinary care, but for the most part, letting them truly be wild. So it was considered isolated enough where it would be great. And it was close enough to the capital where it would be a bit easier to study as well. I would be staying in a gear. Some parts of the world they call it a yurt. In Mongolia, it's a gear. It is a traditional nomadic tent that they travel with. They actually will kick this whole thing down. Um, and it's huge. It's like six meters across, seven meters across, um, or in diameter. <laughs> And they will uh, take it down and travel with it. So I'd be saying this, and I say it's close to the capital, but like relatively, um, because it was still pretty remote. Like really remote. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a distance to. Uh, that we might really call civilization, um, but there is so much beauty in that too, um, where it just everything just smells of sage, and these beautiful blue rolling skies just last forever. Um, so these, this is the depth of Mongolia, and it's gorgeous. And if you ever get the chance to go, I would a hundred percent recommend it. But I end up studying this thing. <laughs> so I was supposed to be with my researcher. He, uh, one of the lead researchers at the Sai National Park. He was my guy. I was going to be with him. We planned this out. My professors had coordinated. It was set. And then, just a 
couple days before my flight. And mind you, like my flight tickets were booked. I had gotten off of work for uh, like nearly a month to go do this research. Um, at the time I was uh, carrying, uh, I was working in the US, uh, caring for wild animals in the care. I was gonna go to work with these horses, but then the lead researcher, he needs to go justify funding for this park to the government. I get it, that took precedent. He needs to go discuss with members of government and why why this horse needed the protection, needed the money, needed the resources, why they should still protect and fund this area and come up with ways to protect it. But I was coming to Mongolia. Like, I, I was still coming here. What was I going to do? So he set me up with one of his other researchers, one of his colleagues. He's like, I got you. It's okay. Zula will take you. She was amazing. But she was studying these guys. I would like to say that I just like intentionally picked like really unflattering images of this cat. But no, they all look like this. They always look like this. The palace cat just permanently looks grumpy. Um, they're very expressive. They just kind of look grumpy or confused, agitated, like they just woke up. Um, so they're also called the Manu, um, but the palace cat, the very elusive palace cat, because I was going out um, at like 4 30 every morning to go looking for this cat in these Soviet era vans that must have suspension made of magic because they could go over the step without uh, breaking down, despite all the rocks that we were just kind of hitting along the way. Didn't see a single one. <laughs> for all the time I was there, I didn't find a single one. Which to me at that point, I was like, these are already dead. I don't think they're actually here. Um, but as Zilla was explaining, no, they, they used to be. They used to go out to them every morning. But we can't anymore. Uh, so that was just how I spent a portion of the morning. Most of my day, Oh, there's lots of life, wildlife, by the way. So much wildlife, no palace cats. Uh, marmots, we have marmots, no palace cats. But we do have these little ones. Uh, so instead, uh, while I was there, I was helping Zula doing prey surveying for the palace cats. Uh, and they eat primarily voles, hamsters, gerbils, the tiny rodents, of Mongolia. That is what we are surveying. So I would set Sherman tracks. So this is a Sherman track here, for those who may not be familiar with Sherman tracks. They're like a little humane catch cage. The animal goes in and it locks behind them. And then you can do whatever you need to, and then you just open the door and they start on out. So I was setting hundreds of these traps all over <laughs> every day. And searching for my hamsters as soon as I got back from looking for this palace cat that was not to be found. Instead, I did find many of these and helped that I was sleeping in a hair. I was sleeping on a dirt floor. I was waking up to them. They were scampering all over. Um, so I did get very familiar with this while, while I was there. That's a really cute one, sir. Um, I just want to justify this next photo here. They weren't harmed. Maybe their dignity was, but like these animals were not harmed. So we would be catching these prey of the palace cats. We would be scruffing them. So step one, you scruff them. You kind of hold them from the back there. It does not hurt them, but it does look pretty weird. Um, and then we were measuring different parts of them. So we would take their weight. We would measure their, their tail length. We measure their ears and um, just to see trends here. Are these animals getting smaller, larger? What are they eating? What's really here? Um, how have these gerbils changed since she's been playing them for decades? So we were studying gerbils, pitching gerbils. It was really cool though. I, I love rodents too. Oh, that was a really incredible experience. 
Uh, but <laughs> well, just a lot of measurements and rodents <laughs> for many weeks. <laughs> but I did see these work. So I was able to go to the sky. While I wasn't able to do the, the qualitative research that I truly planned on doing at this time, I was able to seize horses. So I did take this photo. It is highly zoomed in. I fully acknowledge that, but I did see some of these horses that I had been studying for so long at this point. And they're going to zoom off. So back to the horses. Well, Back on the palace cats and the gerbils. Back on the main topic of what brought you here tonight. Um, so the horses. Uh, so their population has been increasing. Uh, we are looking at, as I said earlier, I guess. Oh, math. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to point a number now. So uh, as you can tell, though, that these numbers are kind of ranges. Also fully recognizing that it does fluctuate quite a bit, just depending on seasonal issues, how much food is available, the winter, sandstorms, other different areas. I would like to say though, my favorite one's the bottom one. Chernobyl's actually been a great place for these horses. Their population is leveled at 150. And it's been like that since their release. Like they, it doesn't really go up, it doesn't really go down. Just a stable population, which is pretty rare for them. So thanks, Chernobyl. Doing great. Keeping these horses fine. Um, even if they crash anywhere else, I'm pretty sure this population will still have 150 of them because we've got decades now of them holding steady. Uh, the captive population is also still doing well. Uh, they are now in hundreds of zoos and breeding centers all throughout the world. Uh, but still lots of research being done pretty recently. I think I want to say within the last five years, we were able to do the first artificial insemination uh, for these species as well. So with a successful whole birth from it. <laughs> so more research is being developed. We're getting genetic banking. So we'll preserve uh, the genes of these species uh, even when the population fluctuates so much. So it is steadily increasing. And as I mentioned before, we've had hundreds of bulls born successfully in the wild now. So it's incredible. But we want to give them the best chance possible. And in order to do that, that, that would mean expanding the areas that are protected. Um, and, and full recognition that there are nomadic peoples that also use these lands and rely on it. And conservation isn't like an animal problem, it's a people problem too. It's, it's how do we, how, how as scientists, as ecologists, as members of the community, do we incorporate others to also support the preservation of this species? So while we need to expand and protect the areas, we also need community buy-in and have others agree in how best to care for these animals even when people want to raise their livestock and want to grow and invest in agriculture, um, which would also lead to combating habitat degradation uh, through just like any area, um, just overgrazing, mining, human uses, human encroachment into these spaces that degrade the spaces that make it kind of unusable for these horses anymore. Um, and then investing in restoring places, especially places that are a lot more habitable than those with such crazy harsh winters, um, places that would be better suited to support this horse species on a longer term. No questions? <laughs> I noticed in your um, wild populations, there are 150 to 200 or so in the Gobi. You mentioned the Gobi's being the worst place to try and survive. Actually, they're doing quite well in the Gobi different area. It's interesting. Yeah, so I kind of meant it comparatively in that, like, you know, they used to be in France. 
maybe anywhere else in Europe that, that may have had a more abundant grazing opportunities for them uh, historically. And so just comparatively, the Gobi Desert is just not as well suited for horse populations. Mm -hmm. Equids just is it's not as suitable. Um, but these guys are hardy. You wouldn't believe it given the fact they weren't extinct in the wild, but they are pretty hardy. And again, they can go very well with cold environments or environments that fluctuate more in temperature that don't have a lot of nutritional food available for them, even when their grasses even lack the nutrients they can still do fairly well. So even in parts of the Gobi Desert, they can make it. Mm -hmm. The Gobi Desert really big, and Chernobyl looks like it's not that big. So the two areas of comparison, Chernobyl is in your zone, can you get the Gobi Desert? It's a big difference. It's right. The Gobi Desert is massive. <laughs> but it's, we're talking a smaller, they're only a small area. And are they all together in 150? No. Or sorry, they are in a greater reserve of it. Um, so of the Gobi Desert, it is huge, but they are located in a smaller reserve. Um, it might, yeah, I guess one or two reserve like spaces in that area with several turns in there. What about the incredible wall? Has it not had any impact on it? I am unsure, as this is not a population study, but to my knowledge, 150 still there. Um, but that was only, that was happening last year. So mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you as of what has happened in the past 12 months. I'm sure it did, because overpopulation of person did, uh, because of this, uh, a lot of studies are already restarted in the, uh, the effects uh, of the war because of like, uh, reserve areas which were bombed, uh, many species of the Red Hook, which already about to extinct and thanks to our lovely neighbor, by chance that we will never see them again when they did, when they bought the Hoka Dam and then there was water and so all the chemicals and everything. I'm sure that and the uh, Russians were around the area, so I'm sure it worked. But, the, that is, but that is the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Yeah. Yes. 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 But one thing I found at the time of release, like this will be fine, is just probably the most suitable habitat we've got. So it's worth in the fact that it has been said for decades that they have had successful offspring from that, um, and that the population has reached a, a semi normal equilibrium point. Um, a long term effects so of possible radiation, it's, there's a chance of that, yes. but. I would probably think the war might be a bigger issue for these ones. Personality ones, what are they like? What are they like? They are horses. They are stubborn. Um, I would say that like, these, these are not domesticated horses. They are not like domesticated horses in that, like, how easy it's still to trust or to train or things like that. that these times were deployed. Angus Kong tried it, he couldn't do it. <laughs> so, like, these horses are very much wild. Um, if Angus Kong actually used to, like, if someone could bring him this horse, he would so highly reward him if they were able to train this horse because it was considered, like, untamable. Um, and then because they were considered untamable, and we can these strong, these guys. Like, of course, in general, are pretty strong. Like, one kick is crazy, but there's small muscle. So, two questions Please. from our online audience. Uh, one follows on from Michelle's question there, which is Have any of the Mongolians ever produced themselves? But I just let all start thinking about their, their nature in general, their behavior. There. That's one question. Has anyone been known to provide? Not to my knowledge. It's possible from hybridization that you have, like, 
you know, you're able to get one to the point through enough of a become enough of a domestic horse where it's now rideable. But at that point, I probably wouldn't consider it a toffee anymore. Um, but I would say to my knowledge, there are mixed like recordings of this, but mostly because I don't know how people can identify the Mongolian horse from the Mongolian wild horse. So mixed studies, mixed reports, probably not. All right, could you, uh, the, um, what is the ancestry of the Mongolian horse? Does that come then from the same uh, uh, lineage as domestic horses over the rest of the world? Yes, so uh, there's some ancient horse study here. All equids have the same ancestor, so they do have a common ancestor. However, of what is branched off from that common ancestor, we've got a, a the tarpon, and then we've got the Equisferus Shabalski, the, the Taki here. So uh, the Mongolian horse, as well as all domestic horses, are coming from that tarpon, while the branch of the Shabalski horse is what's just continued. So from this one, we've got all these different sex we've got all the different breeds of horses that we have um and so those are all of our all of our different domesticated horses which I went feral so it was all coming from the same common uh tarpon and everything else came from the Shabalski horse um but they do have a common ancestor of it's like the the toad a toad of horse because it used to have several toes before before we got home Yes, they were code, oh, which is also why like rhinos also have a pretty similar ancestor as well. Could, could you uh, address, I, I referred to this at dinner, could you uh, address for the uh, the audience here the uh, the wrinkle that was added to what's otherwise a, a neat story by the archaeologists who uh, turned up the remains of Krzyzewski's type horse at Botai uh, uh, in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, and the initial interpretation of that, this was this case was five or ten years ago, uh, subject to the usual uncertainty in my recollection of dates. Uh, uh, they found horse remains and people remains, and the initial conclusion about it. Was that the horses that the Balky horse had been domesticated by the first community to be using horses? So uh, there have been studies with us. Honestly, the scientific literature goes back and forth. They have been, they have been, they have been, have been. Most say that it hasn't been. Of studies like that, well, I haven't actually read the study myself to say was it domesticated. Uh, I, how much was it interbred with a tarpon? And was it just identified because of the number of chromosomes that it had as being the Tobolsky horse? Um, I think I have a lot of questions there as well, but I, I'd i love to hear that. I'd love to read the research there, um, especially because for a horse that has been around for so long, there still isn't like a ton known. Most of what we know about it is kind of comparing it because you guys actually a lot like zebra. Personality-wise, I compare it to a zebra. I think of that those who have that personality, they're like zebras. All right, I, mean, just, I didn't mean to be taking a position on that so, because the, the, I have seen more recent study arguing the opposite, saying yes, those are those are remains of the Kowalski type horse, but the, the age structure of the population based on the bones that they found suggested. And I'm not sure how they do it. Suggested that they were that it was they were not domesticated. That it was a wild population that had, that that was that showed up in the bones. The wild population that was nearby. So this, this is how the evidence goes back and forth. Oh, you don't come out. Like, questions are like keep coming up, especially when we're going to find out. Like these horses were everywhere. Especially as humans, she came everywhere. Yeah. About the loss of the why did the Przewalski identify it if they were everywhere? Why did they what? Why did when did the scientist who named the horse 
make give it a name. 19th century, 18th century. Yeah, it was pretty far along. But, but my point is, look, that means that they must have retracted a lot by then for them not to be commonplace in Europe. Or yes. They, so had they spread out across the world and then ended up only in Central Asia? Yes. So they had spread out across the world, but like we're talking like the Ice Age. Yes. So like, yeah, they they used to be everywhere, but here's so the one that was killed in Germany in 1814. Yes. That was in a zoo or a collection? No. A farm. That was that was a wild horse. Living on its own. They were so fragmented. These populations had become so fragmented that like at the time it was still incredibly rare. Like this was not a horse you would just find across, but people had domestic horses. So you come across like, oh, it's just a really mean horse. <laughs> And maybe there's more of a disconnect, but these four species were very much like a fragmented population. We're not talking, they were incredibly common. It's as human populations in these areas grew, just in general, I'm talking about cities, but like just even beginning of human civilizations, civilizations in these areas, you the horse France. populations now are decreasing anyway. You said they were in France, and the thing that sprung to my mind was those last school cave paintings. Yes. If you know what I'm referring to. They are in that, tons of cases. Would that be the kind of horse depicted there, do you think? Yes. So there are actually there were hundreds of cave paintings found throughout Europe of this species. That is the Chevalsky horse. When you see, especially very blocky, so you can tell they're kind of blocky shaped. So many of those really ancient cave paintings that we find of horses, it's probably them. Unless someone's on their back. In which case, maybe not. They're usually very hefty looking, like really good examples of. Stop what you're shaking. Sorry, question again from the online audience. In the context of the climate change, how about this impact of the migration patterns of the Latin So their current migration patterns are, they don't like, they're not migratory. These are not, um, this is not a migratory person. They, they're pretty stationary, they can be. Um, so as far as climate change goes, I'm unsure. Especially in some of these places, the climate is becoming more harsh. I don't know how they're gonna adapt. And I think that might mean maybe they will be moving or they're going to have to move, but what would that really look like? Especially in the areas where they're located. These are areas we just expect more snowstorms and more desertification and just having more environmental issues because of climate change is where their populations are. Um, I am hopeful. I am still ever the optimist that it will be okay and this population will make it. Maybe it's just because I love them so much that I've had this need to believe that. Um, but that's definitely an ongoing problem for that. And it's going to be an increased threat for pretty much every species everywhere. But they're not migratory, and they live in groups that are going to male dominant. So you're going to be able to get pushed out. Which is how do you manage, how do you plan the corridors to breed in? So that's a great question. So, yes, they do form other herds. They will find, form bachelor herds. Um, but as when I mean migratory, like these are not species that like most things will like run across the west, you know, they'll just keep going. These are ones that will kind of like, I'm a bunker down. Like you're not you're not fighting with other horses. There's food right here. You can manage, you'll make it work. <laughs> um, <laughs> Another question, which is kind of linked to this, but in the context of the hybridization, yes, and looking at how the character, the real character, might be lost. And the example given is the bison herds and domesticated cattle across uh, America. Yeah, I mean, they're like how their their nature, like their personality, would be lost in this. There is a strong possibility, especially with increased hybridization, especially if they come across more domestic horses, especially as with livestock. We're talking like, it's not just goats and cattle, like there are horses coming into these 
population is failing. And like we're losing so much when hybridization occurs. Well, it might give them a better chance in a way, as far as gen diversity goes, with being able to scan the disease. We also recognize that that's losing a part of their nature as well. Like that, there's a chance that a lot of this can be lost. I have a follow-on question, sorry for the one but it's a follow-on question about the bachelors, or rather, is there a type of management of the herds done, or does it just happen because of the nature of the individual's course of action? You mean like human intervention of like culling and that? Remove males from the herds to avoid any issues. For the most part, you want the horses to sort it out. Like, I would say the horse population is in captivity. If it's like in human care and a managed population, yes, then absolutely you intervene a lot more. Um, but when you want a population to be more wild, then you're, you, you want them figured out. You're going to be like, okay, well, here's your adult. Here's your salmon. We'll just take this little one over here. Like, well, good luck catching them. They're wild horses. Like, these are feral animals. It's going to cause them a lot more stress for you to try to intervene. And at that point, like, I feel like you'd be stressing those animals more than you'd be benefiting. They do this naturally. At this point, you're just trying to help them along. Thank you. There, there are. That, that, pattern, that pattern is common to a number of ungulate groups, and I think other groups, I think elephants uh, have that too. You have bachelor uh, elephants. Or her it's Georgia, uh, adolescent uh, elephant occurs. So it's not it's not a, it's not unreasonable to leave the problem to nature. Talking of heads, does Central Asia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, do they have large populations of wild domestic horses that have gone like in North America? You might mention Mustangs at the beginning. Yes. Um, certain areas do have more wild horses, yes, and there's, especially if this population is grown, if we have more talkie, there's a little bit of, that was kind of interjecting your question, I mean, I'm sorry. If they do have wild domestic horses, would they be more better at surviving because they're less, less wild? More adventurous, more tolerant of humans. Possibly. Uh, most of my work has been done on domestic horses, so I couldn't really tell you how well they would fare in similar circumstances. Um, I feel like if I was like kind of logically apply it, like, okay, would they still be a wild horse and behave similarly? But domestic horses, would they be more inclined to be able to live? in closer human proximity. So I would say I'm not really the best person to answer that question. Sorry. So re predators, you had to, one of the threats you listed was predators. I'm assuming the, the, there are wolves there, but what other, are, is, is that a serious? They're all wolves, but I was also referring to human predation. So their fur is, Nice, especially this thick. They do well in the winter, and they are often they all have been historically killed for their fur. Is that what wait to know in Central Asia? Is this so similar? Uh, okay. it's, it is the reason for the population decline, but it's more likely that it was disease and encroachment. But yes, hunting has been reported as being one of the reasons that they have declined. Um, so predation, well, it is illegal pretty much everywhere to kill this animal. It, I'm talking centuries ago, but when? Yes, centuries ago, yes. So I got a few more questions. Right, so in the context of uh, Yehi's current conquering with wide territories, has there been any evaluation of genetic code to see if any more coding wild horses has been introduced in that within or across those territories? Whether Mongolian wild horses are now in areas where gang is conquered. Mongolian wild horses, probably not, but like 
wild horses, Mongolian wild horses. Yes. Um, like not more so than they already would have been. Okay, and uh, other question. Are the turkey considered an endemic species in Mongolia? Uh, they're not just all, they're not just in Mongolia. They also have populations, uh, I guess, now in Ukraine and in China. In parts of Russia, although we believe that those are more close to them, uh, so endemic to those areas now. But and then it's kind of weird work. It's like when they've already been in these spaces, but their population has plummeted. Like, would you consider them endemic to their original range or to their most recent range in recent history? Or would you consider them endemic to where they currently are right now? Because that's all that's left. So I think it's just kind of how you interpret that word. It's a word that kind of can apply however you need it to fit the situation. Could, uh, could you say a word of uh, uh, what, what do or did theorists say before the relative success of the uh, uh, restoring China populations? Uh, what was, uh, more specifically, what was the view of, of uh, biologists who study these things about whether nine individuals had a reasonable chance of restoring a, a, a full self-sustaining population. There are there are people who are pessimistic about things like that, but I don't know how pessimistic they are. Oh, I, I think it's a long time. If you told me you had nine individuals left of a population, I'd be like, well, good luck. <laughs> great, great for trying. But I also say that, but we recognize, like, I feel grateful someone did try. And we look, like, at the success of it now. Like, we have these courses back in the wild because a group of people said, there's nine here, but let's keep trying. To be fair, though, when there were nine, there were still some in the wild. So it's not like they thought, like, this is it. It was like, okay, there's some in the wild, we're gonna to try to breed these, but there's still some left. So they were actively able to breed them for the last one went extinct in the wild. So by the time the ones in the wild went extinct, the human population already increased enough, or if you didn't have nine, you now had like a hundred or several hundred, or it seemed more reasonable. You didn't feel like all hope was lost. So I think maybe just having that perspective of like, okay, we'll breed the nine, but there's more out there. They'll be with those other ones maybe one day. We'll just breed the ones we got because we like having them. So maybe if, if they did just have only the nine and didn't see the wealth population, maybe they would have been more inclined to think this is it. Again, the knowledge of the theoreticians would ultimately be statistical and so you could you could roll uh, snake eyes ten times in a row yeah we are a lot to lose at that point but it, 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 the bottlenecks show up in various it, i guess the, the example most people will know is that the cheetah population is <laughs> oh, said is, 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 is to be inbred because of a bottleneck I've forgotten how many uh, uh, years years ago. It's not hundreds, but it's more than that. But uh, apparently, this shows up in current genetics, and it's possible to demonstrate that there must have been a, uh, a serious decline in the population, but probably not to just not individuals. Yeah, she uh, does definitely have uh, a severe genetic issue in which it they. Kind of all seem genetically inbred. It's like every cheetah, depending on I guess the species of it, we just genetically look like they're all cousins. Um, possibly because of the hybridization initially with the with the nine, um, it did help in a way to prevent that. Um, but yes, they have still have very low genetic variability in this population. Were the nine already like close family? Mm -hmm. no, they, they, 
and they're not the big different ones. So they, I think they were not able to get their ones, uh, but to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. These were like wild caught. I don't think their methods were that great. I don't know how well they studied these before going in. But the ones they have, right? the ones you've shown us with the big assholes, they, they don't appear to be hybrids. They appear to be kind. Yeah. They don't look like they mixed with uh, a normal horses. Yeah, and like they, they, you know, if they're like great grandmother seven lot times down the line may have been a domestic, but everything since has yeah. been taught me like. Eventually, kind of. Water. Yeah, so what we what we have here is talking, yeah. and like genetically they are talking. Chromosomes say these are talking. I just get more questions. Okay, yeah. um, I don't know. We've been talking my time. But what do we think of from the other point of view of um the horses that are domesticated? If if the interbred was happy. Let's take let's take two more questions because we have put you on for quite a few. After you can introduce them into these areas, how long does it take for them to get to the eating the grass the horses not being the breeding time? They can make it in a few years. Because like you want them to not just have like, you had such a nice summer, good luck in winter. Like you want them to like be able to withstand a few winters and maybe you're like providing the first few years. You're like, you're throwing out, you're like spreading some extra food out around here and there. Um, they actually do it with the orcs here too, where like we, you want to rewild them, but they, Sometimes you need to help along. So usually it's a few years of like giving them food, leading them along, helping them out, and then you kind of slowly decrease your intervention in this um, until you have a reasonable level of confidence that these animals can make it. So in the DC zoo, we also have monkeys. So uh, gold mining tamarins. Um, I say we, I wasn't involved in this. Uh, gold mining tamarind monkeys, these little monkeys that are critically, were critically endangered in Brazil. They like rewild these monkeys, but like in DC. So they just have them like in this big like park area and they close this big tree population, just trying to make sure these monkeys be wild. And then from places like that, you can then put them maybe in more enclosed reserves in their natural spaces. It's kind of a several step process. You're not taking one from a zoo, like straight out of the pen, pop it in Mongolia. Like it's a it's a process. You gotta like, okay, we'll give you a big enough space here, maybe a better climate, then we'll give you a bigger space here. Maybe your offspring that are born here in this enclosed space, they'll do even better. And so you kind of give it years, you give it generations so that you can work your way to making sure, or at least having a reasonable level of confidence that this animal will successfully be it. And it's a gamble every time, but you want to give the best shot possible. Right. Five one from the zoom then. All right. Okay, thank you. One. you mentioned we're going to talk about predators. You mentioned wolves. Presumably humans might also relate on, on the diet. What other predators do they suffer from? Not many, I was like microbial, but um, you both afraid because they're big stocking animal. It'd be a big eagle if I'm going off them. So I don't think it's a really big eagle, but like, no, that is not really bears. That at all. Bears. Bears could, but it, they live there. So well, I mean, there are actually like bears, especially in the Gobi. Uh, but. I cannot imagine anything going to mess with one of these pairs. I don't care how appealing one of those offspring is, um, especially with the mares and stallions. Few things are willing to mess with these animals. Um, so predation, I would more refer to humans. Historically, yes, uh, wolves were more of an issue. Now also, less so, uh, <laughs> given current trends, but, 
I, it, it still exists. Thank you. Thank you very much. For your Since you can't run out of the room, you may yet have to entertain one or one or two. Uh, I am here for it all. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for that uh, for that presentation. Uh, this is this is, by the way, a reminder uh, to me to remind all of all of you that if you know people locally who we don't seem to be aware of or have been in touch with about speaking who have natural history experience or stories to tell, please let somebody on the committee know, or in particular, let, uh, let Michelle, our speaker coordinator know, or Val Chalmers uh, or myself, because uh, we try to stay in touch with people, but uh, you can't know everybody and know who's doing what. And this is a good example of uh, uh, somebody that I didn't know about who had a very interesting story to tell, really being there. And so thank you for taking us there to learn about conservation and uh, and uh, do the, uh, the conservation. Uh, with that, I'm going to, uh, we have, uh, um, I'll leave you with nothing. We have a, uh, the Arabian Wildlife Encyclopedia. Uh, you've seen well plugged into uh, all these things, but I'd like I'd like for you to uh, take this away as a uh, as a gift. This is I think it's I think it's link, linked to online things. But since everybody knows I I don't go visiting sites a lot, I don't, <laughs> I don't actually know. So thank you very much. I hope to see you all. Uh, the the January meeting is the what of January? It's not going to be. I'm sure it's not the first uh, uh, Monday. I remind you, our, our normal meeting times uh, are the first Monday of each month, but we adjust for holidays, uh, and we probably seem to make at least three or four adjustments every uh, every year. So don't just show up automatically. It's the eighth. Okay, so it would be the the second. Uh, so I hope to see you on uh, January eighth, uh, and uh, thanks to our uh, home audience uh, as well. Thank you all.